the next speaker is Susan Estrada, who is the founder of something that not everybody may be familiar with uh, called SurfNet, but it was an instrumental part of the early internet. And uh, I think you'll find the talk both in terms of the technology, but also just the, the history and evolution of the internet as extremely exciting. So Susan, take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me today. I wanted to give you um, a quick commercial for where I live, which is in Carlsbad, California. And this screen is our beautiful ranuncula fields that come up in the spring. So if you're ever down here in the San Diego County area, I invite you to stop and have a look at those. Today, I'm gonna cover um, a little bit about SurfNet, the early internet. And we were one of the National Science Foundation's investments in the early internet. But first I wanna talk about SDSC net. So this, this is for ancient times for those of you who are you know younger. Um, <clears throat> the NSF founded, funded the original supercomputer centers in 1984 and 1985 timeframe. And the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is where I worked at the time, uh, created a star-shaped network you can see on your screen there called SDSCNet, and it established remote user access centers. They were modeled after the Department of Energy's things called RUACs. And each one of these lines had a 56 kilobit star satellite network. And when I put out the RFP for that, um, network, one of the uh, vendors looked at me and said, no one has that much data. And I'm pretty sure we've exceeded 56 kilobits a little bit by now. And we had 56 kilobit landline connections to the local institutions. We also had TimeNet for those of you who are really ancient and <clears throat> at 1200 baud. And uh, we installed the ARPANET connection in the spring of 1986. And the NSFNet backbone origins started in 1986 as well with 56 kilobits. We installed 56 kilobits to the NCAR in NCSA in Colorado and in Illinois. And then the East Coast people installed some other connections as well. So that was our five or six connections were our first uh, NSFNet backbone. In June of 1988, we wrote a proposal for a Southern California regional network and we called it SurfNet. And some of you might wonder why we started with the CERF instead of SURF. But at that time, those darn people in the Netherlands already had pick, picked up SurfNet SURF for their own. So we went with a California-based SurfNet. We put together a proposal for a a one and a half megabit fast, screaming fast backbone, which was another, a lot of times in 1988, some of the universities were like, gosh, we, you know, what would we do with that much capacity? We proposed it for 33 academic institutions in Southern California. Uh, and we had two industrial users, SAIC and Northrop. <clears throat> we were always commercially focused because we came from the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which also uh, allowed commercial use of the Supercomputer Center to augment the funding from the National Science Foundation. And we went live in 1989 and our core team were three women, Susie Arnold, Karen Armstrong, who are both, Susie went on to be a IT professional for K-12 schools and Karen Armstrong is teaching second grade this year. This was our dedication in uh, 1989 with VitSurf and we broke a fake champagne bottle full, filled with <clears throat> confetti. And somehow my, there we go. And it just so you know the scope of the NSF investment, this is a map around 1990. Uh, of the NSF sponsored internet protocol networks. So if you look at this, you can see here in Southern California, it's big, obviously. So 
we had the Southern California network here, which was SurfNet. In this area, we had Barnet. The stars here incorporated uh, Northwest Net. We had WestNet, which is this area here with the squares and some down in this area. VNet is Texas. MidNet was Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska. MRNet was Minnesota. And CSA net <clears throat> covered Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. Merit was Michigan. CIC net was brand new, so they didn't have much going on at this point, but they covered Ohio. PSC, the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center, covered Ohio and Pennsylvania. Near net is it here in the Northeast in all these little squares. And they most primarily covered Massachusetts. JVMC Net, which was a, another John von Neumann supercomputer center, also covered New Jersey and some of Pennsylvania. Niger Net covered primarily New York. And Suranet seemed to have reached out to all of the South at that time. <clears throat> so you can see that the NSF at this point had made a pretty significant investment in growing the research and education part of the internet. So also in 1990, SurfNet won the 1990 Interop, Interop Achievement Award. Interop was a trade show that brought together all kinds of different devices that ran IP protocol. And that was the first time anybody had ever really forced the vendors to make all their stuff work with everybody else's stuff. It was quite, uh, quite an amazing opportunity and a really prestigious award at the time. We also deployed a service called Dial and Surf at that point. And we came up with uh, Captain Internet and Surf Boy as a way to kind of simplify the idea of the internet because that in 1990, as you might imagine, nobody really knew anything about the internet. And we spent a lot of time explaining what it is we did for a living. Not so true today. In 1991, we had three international connections in Brazil, Mexico, and South Korea. By our second anniversary, the network had grown to over 100 members, starting from 30 some odd members. <clears throat> we had put in a thread mail gateway to SurfNet, which allowed internet access to the K through 12 schools that were using thread mail. We also joined with PSINet and UUNet to form the Commercial Internet Exchange for interconnecting the networks for commercial internet service. I'm just gonna talk very briefly about the Commercial Internet Exchange. There was a lot of hand-wringing going on at the time. Uh, politically, uh, the NSFNet backbone was sort of doing some things that some of us didn't really wanna be part of. And our three networks, UUNet, PSINet, and SurfNet got together. And we decided to provide a neut neutral connectivity among cooperating carriers, no restrictions on the type of traffic allowance, and no settlements, which was a big deal because settlements were the basis of all telephone services at the time. And most telephone companies believed that there was, you know, you got paid more if you had more volume, et cetera, et cetera. But we decided we didn't want to do that because it became a whole level of um, tracking that we didn't want to be bothered with. So we announced the kicks in March and our first interconnections went up in July of that year. Our customers requested this interconnection. This was the first time that full commercial traffic was allowed over the internet. And this model is actually still in place today for, for many uh, internet providers. At the time, there was this drama, ANS, poaching, internet key fees, interconnect fees, settlements, and et cetera. We, and that was, um, this was our way around that. And it worked pretty darn well since it's still there today. In 1992 and 1993, the network was self-sufficient, i.e. it paid for itself and commercial traffic was still allowed. We provided uh, 24 by seven support. We had a bunch of new services. We had Surf 56, the, the 1544, which is a T1. We had um, 4500, 
45,000, which was a T3 at the time, which was, you know, huge. That's pretty much less than what you get to your home today on your broadband. We had 14.4, which was a dedicated dial-up service, dial observe plus, dial observe hourly. We had a toll-free number, all you can eat, unlimited. And then we also funded a surfnet in the K-12 classroom called Surf and Safari, uh, which was the teacher's first introduction to utilizing the internet and gave them an opportunity to have a free connection for a few months so that they could practice uh, the adventures that they learned in this comic book. And then by 1994, you can see the complexity of the network here. There was a lot of connections. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> in our last comic book, and uh, I think you can see that we put um, Captain Internet as a skier by then. Captain Internet, of course, was a woman. And this is, you can see that in this final slide that San Diego was the hub for many connections here in the Bay, in the Southern California region. We also had a connection up to San Jose at that point. We had the connection to the Commercial Internet Exchange, also to Nevada Net, which was grown by this point, SDSC Net, and then ES Net, which is the Energy Sciences Network. So, you know, the in a very short period of time from the late, very late 80s until 1994, there was unbelievable growth and an opportunity to continue on with an amazing thing that still is today a pretty amazing thing when you have the world in your pocket. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thank you very much. That was that was great and fascinating. Um, so my I have a whole set of questions, and it has to do with um, interoperability and what it takes to make that happen. And of course, it, it's gotten better as we've standardized on you know a single set of protocols. But I, I'm thinking back when when you guys were doing this stuff early on, um, there was some diversity of protocols. <laughs> protocol translation and all that. So I wonder expansively, because we have a little bit of time, if you could talk about, you know, how you approach that and, you know, any thoughts you have um, in general about, you know, when you're trying to get disparate systems to talk to each other, you know, what are, what are some of the things you learned along the way? Well, they don't talk to each other. <laughs> That's the main thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they, you know, initially, when I started at the Supercomputer Center, we were using um, what we called the MFE net, which is a DECnet based protocol. And that was very specific. Um, you know, for those of you who remember DEC, they had a very specific protocol. IBM had its own protocol. Everybody had their own protocol. And um, we, it was a much simpler, you know, Apple had its own protocol. At that time, everybody had their own talking between computers protocol. And when we started building the regional networks, Dennis Jennings was at the um, National Science Foundation. He was program director. And he was uh, decided that there was this sort of fight between the OSI, which was one protocol that was sort of like the 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 one that people thought was you know the right way to go and really great and all that stuff but nobody was implementing it really but he thought we should go with TCP/IP which was a more um, grant it was a more ground up protocol it was kind of managed by a, a group of people who kind of got together and threw spaghetti on the ceiling and saw, saw what worked. So when we started building the regional networks, we all built them on TCP IP, which was very scandalous at the time. And um, it turned out, I mean, SDSC, it was actually the first one that wrote a TCP IP interface for Cray supercomputers. So we were able to kind of go with that protocol and you know, the, the rest is history. It's still the protocol that's used 
on the backbone of the internet. And there's still, there's some tweaks and stuff that have happened obviously in the last 30 years. But um, that's, it was the OSI protocol went bye-bye and that was like the thing. So it was very interesting to see how the internet sort of um, enveloped the whole protocol wars at the time. Yeah, well, I, I sort of remember that. I remember LU 6.2 from IBM. <laughs> And all yeah. those things. Uh, the uh, so then the, the other question I have is, you know, as you look at, of course, the internet today with you know literally billions of nodes all talking to each other reasonably reliably, which I don't know about you, I always find it pretty startling, actually. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> but that's really you know when you look through the history of all these things. Um, do you think, I mean, obviously TCPIP was one of those decisions. Are there other decisions you think you guys made that enabled, you know, this pretty small thing that was used, you know, probably relatively fragile at the time to become the, you know, part of the world that we see today? It's hard to, well, that's a, that's an interesting question. We had, um, you know, it, you know, the, the thing about the old and dinosaur days of the internet is that you know, we all knew each other. So if something happened, we could pick up the phone and call. When I, when we started our network, we bought Cisco Systems routers and they, we were there in their, the year that we purchased our routers, we were 10% of their gross revenue for the year, which is crazy. And they had 15 people on staff. Whoa. Now they have streets and stuff up there, which is just mind boggling to me. Um, and so if I needed anything done, I could just pick up the phone and call somebody. So today, what did we do? I mean, the interesting thing, I think, is the, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is the standards body behind the, the Internet. And back then it was small and primarily um, focused with um, the r and &E community. And today there's a lot of commercial entities that are part of that. So there's a lot more um, vigorous growing of things to make uh, all of the, everybody's devices work properly. So I think the IETF really is the um, is one of the bottom line things that kind of made history. The other one of NSS investments was an, inner, was an investment of a proposal that I actually wrote called the Internic. And that was in 93-ish. And that actually took over funding of the domain name system, which is, you know, like aldea.com or usc.edu. They took over that function as well as um, some other directory services functions. And that turned into kind of like turning the domain name system, which, you know, got us out of typing in 192.whatever.whatever.whatever to actual names. Um, that really changed, I think, the way that it was, it would became much easier to get domain names and things, and that helped businesses a lot. But I think the two, having a, an independent standards body that's not run by any country, that's not run by any particular company, that was big. And the other thing, um, is the domain name system change. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for, again, another great talk.